Good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful morning in Washington. And I'm Randy Weingarten, and I'm the president of the American Federation of Teachers. During this time, when so many schools had to close for in-person teaching and learning, there has been a new appreciation for public schools. There's no doubt schools must be open in person five days a week with the space and facilities to do so. We know that's how kids learn best and that prolonged isolation is harmful. School is where children learn. It's where they work together and play together. It's where they form relationships and learn resilience. It's where many children who otherwise might go hungry eat breakfast and lunch. Parents rely on schools too, not only to educate their kids, but so they can work like the three million moms who dropped out of the workforce during the pandemic. This pandemic has also underscored how important educators are. Teachers scramble to redesign lessons and projects to create virtual field trips and labs to keep kids engaged and learning from afar. School worker, school food workers kept meals coming, often feeding anyone in the community who needed it. Many school bus drivers delivered those meals along with schoolwork and internet hotspots so students could learn from home. All the while, educators have yearned to be back in school with their students. And they only ask for two things, two things, a safe workplace during this pandemic and the resources they and their students need to succeed. Educators are exhausted. They're working longer hours, troubleshooting IT programs, and trying to connect with students despite the barriers, whether that's a computer screen or a plexiglass shield. And if there's an educator in your life, you know this. Yet critics have scapegoated teachers and vilified their unions because of the school closures during the pandemic ignoring the extreme disparities among schools and blaming teachers for problems outside their control. Creating safe conditions in schools during a public health crisis is not an obstacle to reopening classrooms. It's the pathway to going back, staying back, and creating trust through the school community. That commitment to both safety and education is why the AFT moved quickly to put out our first plan to reopen schools safely in April 2020, just weeks after COVID overtook our country. We developed our plan with health and education experts and with input from our members. That was our plan. Many AFT affiliates have used it to negotiating school reopening plans. But we face stiff headwinds. Donald Trump tweeted at schools to reopen, but did nothing to help them do so safely. The Trump administration politicized safety and undermined science. And as a result, from last April 2020, right up to January 19th, 2021, we were working to reopen schools in a climate of chaos, fear, and misinformation as the pandemic surged in wave after wave. Thankfully, the Biden administration changed course. They are fighting the pandemic with science, truth, transparency, and yes, money. Of course there have been bumps in the road. This is a once in a century pandemic. But as a result of their leadership and all of our efforts, the collective efforts of the education community. Today, 97% of schools across the country are open for in-person learning, either full or part-time. Conditions have changed. We can and we must reopen schools in the fall for in-person teaching, learning, and support. And we must keep them open fully and safely five days a week. But we must do more than physically return to schools, as important as that is to crave the normalcy and create the normalcy we crave. 
We must also put into place the supports to help students recover socially, emotionally, and academically. And we must reimagine teaching and learning to focus on what sparks students' passion, what builds confidence, what nurtures critical thinking, and brings learning to life. So all children have access to the opportunities that give them the freedom to thrive. And we must, and this may be the most important thing I say today, we must do this for all children. The United States must do what we've never done in our wonderfully diverse society, fully enable all children to reach their heights, to prepare them for college, career, civic participation, and life. We can seed a renaissance in America's public schools that will change young people's lives and change the course of our country. We can make every public school a place where parents want to send their children, where educators want to work, and where students thrive. Given current circumstances, nothing should stand in the way of fully reopening our public schools this fall and keeping them open. Of course, it's not risk-free. Public health experts caution that unless many more people get vaccinated, we will not reach herd immunity against COVID. But we can manage the threat by encouraging people to get vaccines and following guidance from the CDC that prevents the spread of the disease. That guidance currently includes the layered mitigation of masking and distancing, ventilation and sanitizing, hand washing, and COVID testing and contact tracing, those two things help prevent outbreaks and minimize quarantines. So since I've been fully vaccinated, I have used this time to visit schools in Connecticut, Texas, New Mexico, Washington, D.C., and New York. All of them have successfully reopened with the safeguards I just talked about in place. But as Education Secretary Miguel Cardona observed, when we visited schools in White Plains, New York, the glue that holds it together is resources and relationships. The resources from the American Rescue Plan and the collaboration among educators, including administrators and union reps and parents who collectively have worked together to solve reopening questions in the face of tremendous uncertainty. Frankly, the feeling I've been left with in all of these school visits is the joy, the smiles, the fun, the relief expressed by students and staff at being back in school. What was the game changer? It's the vaccines. I hear it in educators' voices and I see it in our polling results. The fear that they will bring the virus home decreases the moment educators get the shots. And our members have stepped up. According to our data, 89% of our members are fully vaccinated or want to be. And it's really good news that just this week, the CDC and the FDA have authorized the use of the Pfizer vaccines for 12 to 15 year olds. <coughs> Excuse me. But the fear isn't gone. You see it in who is back in school and who isn't. Some school staff need accommodations to protect their health of that or of someone else in their household. And some families still are considering keeping their children at home. We wanted to figure out what to do to deal with that. So the AFT, along with the NAACP, LULAC, and others, recently polled parents of public school students. <clears throat> Only 73% of parents said they are comfortable with full in-person learning for their children this fall, and only 59% of black parents. But if the safety measures in the AFT's reopening plan, the layered mitigation, the testing, and the vaccines are in place, that comfort level jumps to 94% of parents, including 87% of black parents. 
parents whose children's schools are reopened in person feel more comfortable with in-person learning, and the same is true of educators. The more they are in school with appropriate safeguards, the more they trust it. Mitigation measures create trust. So does collaboration. So here's an idea. Every school should have a committee of school staff, parents, and where appropriate students to plan for and respond to safety issues. These committees can conduct health and safety school walkthroughs this summer, just as we did last month in Washington, D.C., at McKinley Tech High School and Middle School with the school chancellor, members of the School Parents Association, the union, and others. And I'm so grateful that the union president, Jackie Pogue-Lyons, is with us today. Here's another idea. Let's integrate the best practices for both health and learning. One way is to link class size to the CDC's revised guidance that with universal masking, students should remain three feet apart in classrooms. For the most part, this will mean fewer students in each class, effectively aligning health and pedagogical best practices. Smaller class size has been shown to have a positive impact on academic achievement, safety and suspension rates, and teacher retention. So why don't school systems work through the summer to find adequate space and to keep those classes intact all school year? The constant changing and reconfiguring of this past year is part of what has created such uncertainty. And by doing this, we'll also help end the untenable practice of simultaneous teaching. That juggling act required teachers to essentially teach two classes in two different modalities, one with kids in classrooms, one with kids online, all at the same time. And frankly, unless there's a compelling reason, it's not just untenable and unsustainable, that practice is educationally disastrous. The United States will not be fully back until we're fully back in school, and my union is all in. The AFT does a back-to-school campaign every year to engage members, but this year our campaign is back to school for everyone. We are dedicating five million dollars for this unprecedented effort. We'll still connect with teachers and school staff, but we'll also reach out to families and communities about the value of children returning to school in person. From San Francisco, California, to Kanawha, West Virginia, from Jefferson, Paris, Louisiana, to Minneapolis, Minnesota, from pre-K to higher ed, we are developing programs and deploying activists to this campaign like we would for any Get Out the Vote campaign. Some of our locals, like the Pittsburgh Federation of Teachers, will go door to door, visiting students' homes to talk about the health and safety and the education programs in place, and to encourage families to send their children back for in-person learning. In New York City, my home local, the United Federation of Teachers, is advocating for schools to hold open houses for parents to show them health safeguards and other resources and to answer questions and build trust. The United Teachers of Los Angeles and the Chicago Teachers Associate, or Union, excuse me, the Chicago Teachers Union, Karen Lewis would have hated that I made that mistake. So the UTLA and the CTU are participating in COVID vaccination events for students, families, and communities. The CTU is calling on the mayor and the school district to work with them over the summer to engage the vast majority of families that have opted to stay remote and to overcome the obstacles to sending their children back to school. The AFT will operate office hours in clinics designated times when affiliates and others can call in to discuss ideas and get technical support. And we hope to have parents and superintendents with us in this effort. And share my lesson, the AFT's free online platform for education resources will be a clearinghouse for best practices. So when I tell you we're all in, we're all in. And yesterday, our executive council unanimously approved a resolution on everything that I am talking about today. But returning is not enough. 
we have to focus on recovery. Students will enter our schools this fall with an array of social, emotional, and academic needs. And schools must meet them. The good news is that the American Rescue Plan provides the funding. So here's another idea. The United States Department of Education requires school systems to consult with stakeholders, including teachers, other educators, school staff, and their unions, in planning for the use of these funds. By the way, they also require that we consult with parents who must have a voice in all of these things. So together with families and community partners, we could use collective bargaining, school board meetings, legislative hearings to collectively press for what kids need. Imagine working with parents to advocate for upgraded school libraries with high-speed Wi-Fi and multilingual literature or upgraded ventilation systems, or mental health services for students and staff. There was an epidemic of anxiety and depression among young people, even before the stress and isolation caused by COVID. And it may not be readily apparent to school staff which students' time away from in-school learning was especially traumatic, where the parent lost their job, a loved one was sick or died, a student was cyberbullied or experienced violence. And frankly, even for kids who were in school this year, we see lots of trauma. Returning to in-person school may cause students to feel even more anxious they may fear getting sick. They have, may have grown disconnected from peers. They may be self-conscious about physical changes they have experienced. And racial injustice has been a pandemic within the pandemic. COVID has intensified the existing inequities in the United States. People of color suffer higher rates of infection serious illness and death from COVID. They are more likely to work in risky frontline roles or to have lost their job during the pandemic. And black and brown Americans too often are unsafe and feel unsafe from the very people who are supposed to keep them safe. And while ugly vestiges of anti-Asian racism were stoked anew by the last administration, now anti-Asian hate incidents have surged. All of this is traumatizing. So social emotional learning is not an add-on. We know that students' mental and physical health, their sense of physical and emotional safety, their connection to caring adults, their access to challenging culturally relevant content, and their engagement by teachers and paraprofessionals who value the knowledge they bring from home, all of that matters to their academic learning and overall development. That's why social emotional learning is for everyone and is directly related to achievement. So now, as we emerge from the pandemic, we have to build that understanding in how we organize and staff schools and strengthen the skills and knowledge of all the adults so that more kids have access to specialized supports to learn and to thrive. And let me talk about academics. There's a lot of concern about learning loss and even warnings about a lost generation. There have been widespread disruptions to learning and equity gaps have grown even wider. Remote instruction is not on par with in-person teaching and learning, and this is especially true for students with special needs. But this deficit mindset ignores what students have learned this year, and it assumes there won't be any efforts to help students recover. So speaking of recovery, let's offer programs this summer that help students get back into routines, provide academic support, programs that are fun, and help kids get their mojo back. 
Let me give you a couple of examples. Cincinnati's public schools will offer voluntary academic classes in the morning, followed by enrichment in the afternoon. And Jamal Davis, this wonderful kindergarten teacher at Euler Elementary School, is on Euler's summer planning committee. Jamal says they're planning a summer experience like no other, with nature expeditions, journaling, broadcasting, and inviting a nearby aquarium to bring sea life to the school. And then there's Miami-Dade, the home local of our Secretary, our Secretary Treasurer, Fed Ingram, who's also here with us today. In Miami-Dade, the district is using $50 million in federal relief funds to offer in-person and virtual summer programs to 10 times more children this year than previously. In addition to academic classes and credit and course recovery, kids in Miami will have fun with dance, art, band, sports, cooking, STEM, and creative writing. School counselors will be at all the open school sites and mental health services will be available to any student in need throughout the summer, whether that person is in person or virtual. Like many other places, schools in Dearborn, Michigan will use federal dollars for summer programs with academics in the morning and enrichment in the afternoon. There, teachers are being asked that if they have a special skill or talent, to teach it or share it in the afternoon. Dearborn's full day program is from nine to five and will run a full eight weeks. Look, we want kids to return to school this fall with less stress and more resilience. And we'll meet students where they are and provide the necessary interventions and supports. That's why the UFT laid out a five-point plan to do just that. Intervention teams comprised of a guidance counselor, psychologist, school social worker, and a teacher will conduct quick diagnostics to assess each student's academic, psychological, and social needs. This will allow school staff to provide personalized interventions to address a student's need, and if necessary, to refer that student for clinical intervention with outside partners. The UFT, as part of this five-point plan, is also advocating for smaller class sizes in 100, in the, 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 the 100 of the city's most neediest schools. School staff in New York City, this is the third point, will conduct high school transcript analysis to get students, especially those who fell off during remote schooling, back on track to graduate and to help all educators identify trauma in children and in other adults, the union has created real professional development available to all of our members. When students need help with concepts or skills, high quality tutoring can have a high impact. Consistent, frequent sessions with a teacher, a paraprofessional, or other trained tutor aligned with their classes and curriculum, can increase student learning and build confidence and interest in school. And that's why, in Gary, Indiana, the school day will be extended by 90 minutes this fall to offer tutoring. And teachers in Anderson, Indiana, will offer after-school tutoring two days a week. And of course, teachers will be compensated for this additional time. In classrooms across the country, teachers will do what we always have done. They'll use what practitioners call, practitioners call formative assessments, which is an ongoing process to check for understanding and identify students' strengths and weaknesses. Teachers use this to adjust instruction to ensure that students understand concepts and have the knowledge and skills that are scaffolds for the next level. It's what we do. Practices like this tell us much more in real time than any end of the year standardized assessment. So these are just some ways that educators are planning to meet students' academic, social, and emotional needs. And there are more 
in Learning Beyond COVID-19, a guide produced jointly by the NEA and the AFT. As much as we want to feel normal again, we can do better than the old normal. We don't have to accept vast inequality, chronic underfunding, and narrow test-based accountability systems. We have a rare opportunity to reimagine public schooling in America and to pursue bold initiatives that will help all our kids thrive. I just love President Biden's proposed American Families Plan that would provide four more years of free public education, two years of early childhood education, and two years of higher education and his American Jobs Plan, which will ensure that every American has essentials like safe drinking water and reliable broadband access. But today I'm focused on what we should do right now. We should provide every student a positive school climate. We should take care of their physical and emotional health and offer them a rich, well-rounded education. Look. We do all of this very well for some kids, yet really poorly for others. Let's do it well for everyone. And that starts, first and foremost, with schools being safe and welcoming places. Safe from violence, safe from poor ventilation, safe from mold and contaminants like lead and asbestos, safe from the spread of COVID, safe from discrimination and bigotry, and safe for every child to feel that they are welcome for who they are. And the same should be true for their families and for school staff. Being stigmatized because your mom needs an interpreter when she enrolls you in a new school, that's not safe and welcoming. Having your enthusiasm for learning misinterpreted as disrupting the class because you're a black boy, that's not safe and welcoming. Refusing to use students' preferred pronouns is not safe and welcoming. While these practices are not the norm, they exist. We have to have honest conversations about what school safety and school climate look like and what policies and practices can and must change. Safety comes, too, from the experience of learning itself. Let's be honest. Bias is built into our education system. From history textbooks that glide over oppression to the systemic underfunding of inner city, tribal, and rural schools, to the overrepresentation of black and brown children in special education and their underrepresentation in gifted in college track programs. The result, inequitable outcomes for students of color and students who are vulnerable. Whether you're an educator or student, we can't change practices that have a racist impact if we're not well grounded in what they are, what types of changes are needed, and how to make those changes. You can call that anti-racist because it is, or you can call it being racially literate, because that is what we as educators need to be. But please, we're talking about our kids. Don't turn this into another cultural war. A few decades ago, education research focused on the importance of positive identity development and cross-cultural awareness. That helps all students appreciate the richness our differences bring to our society. But that's not enough. Culturally responsive education helps debunk long-standing misconceptions about the academic potential of students of color. It values the knowledge and skills students bring from their homes and communities. And it develops student agency as powerful learners and problem solvers. Our country is culturally and linguistically diverse. That's an asset, not a liability. In many schools, there are not just two or three languages spoken, but hundreds of languages. And it's really important to ensure that we help prepare our English language learners to succeed. 
we have to make sure that all kids, all kids feel safe, secure, and valued. That's what we mean when we say that we must support the cultural competence of all. And increasing the diversity of the workforce will hugely help. It's a key ingredient to helping all kids learn and grow. Community schools can help organize much of what I've talked about today. These schools are hubs of well-being and support for children, families, and communities. They partner with nonprofits and local government and businesses to meet a host of needs. They solve a problem educators have long encountered that a student who is hungry, a student in distress, a student who can't see the board will struggle to learn. So by integrating academics, enrichment, nutrition, and medical and mental health services, community schools truly meet the needs of the whole child. And by anchoring the school in the daily life of the community and connecting families with services, community schools build trust and remove obstacles to getting the support teachers, kids, and families need. And today, that's more important than ever. And again, the American Rescue Plan can help fund it. Take some examples that we've done before. In Baltimore, staff at the Wolf Street Academy, that's Baltimore, Maryland, helped undocumented parents who lost their jobs apply for food benefits and increase the school's food programs for families. In Houston, Texas, AFT members are partnering with Brighter Bites to distribute food and fresh produce to families at Dogan Elementary School, a school I got to visit last week. At the Binghamton University Community Schools, which covers 10 rural schools in, or I think it's 10 rural school districts in New York's southern tier. They provided Chromebooks and Wi-Fi for students and families so they could connect to online classes. And I love this. They held virtual cafes for the many grandparents who are guardians for students to help them with remote learning. And when most school programs went online during the pandemic in Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Community Learning Centers in Cincinnati, Ohio, were able to keep school health services open so students and families could continue to receive care. Their mental health partners in, this coming, in these coming months will integrate these supports into the summer session, working side by side with the teachers on social emotional learning, while also continuing to provide dental, vision, and college access throughout the summer. We've heard over and over again in these last 14 months how important schools are to help meet kids' needs. So let's meet these needs with bold action by accelerating progress towards our goal of creating 25,000 community schools through the United States of America. So students have surprised themselves by yearning to be back in school this year. Let's make sure schooling meets their and our country's aspirations. Learning should be engaging and relevant so students see it as worthwhile. Young people need a rich foundation, of course, in math and language arts. We've known that for decades. But we are in a period of time when subjects with renewed currency and importance have been squeezed out by subjects that count for accountability purposes. Art and music, science and civics can cultivate students' passions with catalytic educational effects. So not every child will grow up to be a scientist, but every child should grow up with a strong foundation in science. Science literacy enables people to make informed decisions, solve problems, and protect the health of the world. Science has heightened urgency and relevance because of the climate crisis and the pandemic. Science can help us get out of this pandemic if only more people will let it. Fascinating breakthroughs and vexing challenges are all around us. Nanotechnology, gene editing, sustainable cities, even advances in 3D printed organs. 
what seemed like the future is here right now, so it must be in our schools. So here's another idea. Let's make room in the school day and in the curriculum for rich, deep science programs. And let's work with industry and nonprofits to create pathways to science careers. Elementary schools and elementary students can plant a garden and they can study how to improve their vegetables growing conditions. Middle school students can experiment with desalinization to provide safe and plentiful drinking water. And older students, they can explore the social, cultural, economic, and political implications of human impact on the environment. Students, particularly those in our most chronically under-resourced communities, they need opportunities to engage in scientific practices beyond the lab in their school, if a lab is even available in their school. Partnerships with engineering and architectural firms, departments of energy, chambers of commerce, conservation organizations, and local hospitals. Those kind of partnerships will allow students to see themselves as scientists, as engineers, and to seek careers in STEM fields. Okay, I'm not a scientist. I'm a social studies teacher, and I'm a lawyer. So it's no surprise I've been calling for civics curricula for decades. But in the wake of the January 6th insurrection, I have rededicated myself to this cause. I watched that insurrection from my office in Washington, which was a couple of blocks from the Capitol. The need for civic education and participation could not be clearer. Not dry didactic lessons on topics such as how a bill becomes a law. Young people learn how to be citizens in a democracy by actually engaging in the work of citizenship, examining an issue that is important in their own lives, studying what different parts of government and civil society can do to address it, and advocating for policies to make change. That's what Shayla Street, a high school senior in Philadelphia, did recently. There she is. She organized a march to demand better for kids more mental health supports, safe buildings, a more culturally responsive curriculum, and equal access to magnet schools and high-level courses for all students. More than 100 supporters marched with Shayla from City Hall to the school district headquarters. This young woman knows her civic strength, and she's flexing it. I taught. AP Political Science at Clara Barton High School in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. I gotta brag a little. It was thrilling to see my students, who are mostly black and brown immigrants from poor and working class families, flex their civic muscles. My students won high honors in several state and national We the People civics competitions. My students could match any student from any affluent background. But that's not the point. Here's my point. Students shouldn't have to wait for an AP government class to debate the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. That should begin in elementary school and grow deeper in junior high school and in high school. These are the things that really engage kids and build that muscle, the muscle of civic participation. But civic participation has declined over the last half century, and that decline has not been evenly distributed. Research points to civic deserts where the decline is much steeper and people have many fewer opportunities for civic participation. And not surprisingly, these civic deserts are in the same communities, largely poor and working class, immigrant and of color, that experience food deserts and lack of services and opportunities that exist in other communities. Civic education can help change this. This isn't about politics. This is about patriotism. And you know what is a great way to teach science, civics, music, and art? Project-based learning. Students show what they know as they progress through a unit, not simply take a test at its conclusion. They own the learning process, either individually or in teams. This approach to teaching and learning tells us far more about what students know and can be able to do, then selecting A, B, C, D on a standardized test. 
So one of my favorite experiences as a teacher was the moot court trials my students conducted in the high school law class I taught. Okay, they could have simply taken tests, but instead they were the judge, the attorneys, the witnesses, and the jurors. They learned so much as they prepared for trial, and in presenting what they learned, they were teaching their classmates as well. Westinghouse High School in Pittsburgh is a great example of project-based learning. With support from a grant from the AFT Innovation Fund and support from Pittsburgh, Westinghouse offers students a full academic program, including CTE pathways for public safety careers in firefighting, emergency medical services, and law enforcement. You see a picture of it there. It uses project-based instruction to help students apply the technical knowledge and skills they will need to enter these fields and earn industry certifications. And in Peoria, Illinois, the Greater Peoria Works CTE program has provided internships and job placement opportunities for more than 400 students in fields ranging from health services to manufacturing, arts and entertainment, and city government. The AFT and many school districts have invested in CTE project-based learning. We are a big believer in CTE, but you know who else is? Kids are. Nearly 95% of students who have concentrations in CTE programs graduate from high school. That's about 10 percentage points higher than the national average. And survey data have shown that students are more satisfied with their education experience, those meaning CTE students, than students who are not involved in CTE. But the unrelenting focus on standardized tests has hampered the use of project-based learning. Our current system of accountability relies heavily, almost exclusively, on standardized tests, particularly in math and English language arts. It's created incentives against providing a rich, varied education. This system takes an especially heavy toll on the schools and students with the greatest needs. So those who most need academic enrichment are least likely to get it. And if you need proof of the limitations of standardized tests, consider that of the 750 students admitted to New York City's acclaimed Stuyvesant High School for this coming fall, only eight are black and 20 are Latino. Similar trends are seen at other selective public high schools requiring admission exams. So, if most elite colleges and universities now use a number of measures, not just a singleized standardized exam for admission, why can't selective high schools do the same? New York City's UFT has advocated for the elimination of a single high stakes exam for entrance to these schools since 2014. And given all the criticism about standardized assessments this spring, clearly tests are not the be all and the end all. We have an opportunity to rethink accountability and assessment Let's change accountability systems to organize schools around teaching and learning, around what we want children to know and be able to do, and around the science of learning and development instead of around testing. At the classroom level, let's offer students at least one project they can delve deeply into, either on their own or with other students. They can show what they have learned through meaningful projects capstone experiments and projects. It could be a research paper, a science experiment, an oral history project, or a mini graphic novel. But this requires changing accountability on the federal level. So here's another idea. We're calling on Education Secretary Miguel Cardona to form a task force to rethink how we assess student learning and how to measure what really counts. Finally, The United States must also reimagine how we staff our schools. 
and how we support the people who work in them. How many years have we lamented the teacher shortage? Is there really a shortage of people who would consider teaching? Or is there a shortage of respect, support, autonomy, and funding so students and teachers can be successful? And of salaries befitting our profession? I think we know the answer. In focus groups prior, prior to the pandemic, educators told us they were frustrated, demoralized, and stressed. They lamented the lack of classroom autonomy, the deprofessionalization of teaching, and the lack of respect. Teachers need the freedom to teach. And more than ever, educators need time to plan and time to work collaboratively with their colleagues. And they need the time and the tools for the in-class formative assessments I talked about earlier, and the flexibility to change curricula, to build on students' strengths, and to also meet students' needs. And they need support to teach kids facing trauma. And in addition to teachers, we need school guidance counselors, psychologists, and nurses, but we're facing extreme shortages. The federal government estimates by 2025 the shortage of school counselors will reach almost 80,000 people. For every one school psychologist, there are an estimated about 1,200 students. And more than one quarter of schools don't employ a nurse, even right now. Our affiliates have been fighting for and winning long-term commitments to get more of the nurses, counselors, psychologists, speech and language, and other professionals we know our students need. We've seen this in Chicago, LA, New York City, St. Paul, and many other places. And now, thanks to President Biden, more resources are available for these essential roles. So, with all these staffing needs, it's really painful to hear people say, we better not use the rescue plan funding for staff because what will happen when it goes away, or if it goes away? Stop, just stop. Let's use this money as a down payment. Let's give our kids what they need. And we got some great models showing the way. The Teacher Academy, which is a new project with the Newark, New Jersey Public Schools and the Newark Teachers Union, will offer high school students a pipeline to careers as teachers with an eye towards increasing teacher diversity in the state of New Jersey. Graduates of the Academy will have earned enough credits to work as teaching assistants, power professionals, while completing their degree. The AFT partnered with Montclair State University to design the program's curriculum, and the university will provide adjunct professors to mentor students. And by the way, the AFT is partnering with Kane College in New Jersey to create some work to do community schools and training for community schools. These partnerships with colleges are really important. AFT New Mexico in 2017 led the charge to reimagine teacher preparation and professional support for teacher assistants to pursue a teaching degree and license. The union successfully lobbied for the Grow Your Own Teachers Act, which provides a continuum of support for teacher assistants and other aspiring teachers, including year-long clinical residency programs. Teacher residency programs provide aspiring teachers the opportunity to earn a salary while working with an expert educator. And locally tailored programs can prepare teachers in shortage areas such as math, science, or special education, and can attract a more racially diverse candidate to the profession. Teachers who complete residencies are more likely to stay in their jobs. I'll give you an example. 80% of the San Francisco teacher residency program participants are still teaching in that district after four years, and that compares to 38% of the other new hires over that same period. This same process, these same kinds of residencies, this same kind of process for Grow Your Own, the work with colleges, it can happen for school nurses, psychologists, social workers, and guidance counselors. That's why we're so glad that President Biden recently announced plans to address 
teacher and other shortages, to improve teacher preparation, and to strengthen pipelines for teachers of color. He's calling on Congress to double scholarships for future educators, to make major investments in Grow Your Own programs, to, to invest in teacher preparation at HBCUs and other minority-serving institutions. And while we are a big proponent of canceling up to $50,000 of student debt, another tool at the federal government's disposal to help attract and retain educators is the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. When administered properly, and we have every faith that the Biden administration can get PSLF on track, tens of thousands of teachers and other public servants can, after 10 years of qualifying payments, have their student loans forgiven. PSLF has the promise to be a game changer in helping dedicated educators, especially educators of color who have disproportionately high loans, commit to and stay in teaching while saving for their own homes or for their own children's college education. Returning, recovering, reimagining, we're all yearning to move forward after this difficult year. For our young people, that means being back in school with their peers and with caring adults and with all the supports they need. Despite all the divisions in our country, there is a consensus around the importance of strong public schools. That is especially vital now when we need our schools to provide access to a great, well-rounded education and to help students recover socially and emotionally. No one has come through these trying times unscathed. I truly believe we have a rare chance to see a renaissance in America, to see a renaissance in Americans' public schools, a time of flowering in culture and learning, just like in the Harlem Renaissance or the European Renaissance. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity not only to recover, not only to reopen, but to reimagine our schools in a way that every public school is a place parents want to send their kids, educators and support staff want to work, and most importantly, our students thrive. This is our moment. Thank you.